this morning. Uh, I don't know how this will turn out. I'm using one of these electronic gadgets that um, is liable to, as I'm looking at it, be messed up. And I might be sharing over here when I'm supposed to be sharing over here. So just flow with me this morning. Amen? It is good to have all of you with us today. And as we share this morning, may you know that we're wanting to share the heart of God and the love of Christ. And so we're asking this morning that your heart be open to hear and to, to respond. This is not to be about legalism in any way, shape, or form. We're not here to build a case for, as we have said in the past, or to build a case of anything. But how many of you want to draw as close to God as you can? Amen? And in these last days, we need to be as close to the Lord. In fact, the Lord tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, and even so much more so as we see the ends of the days approaching. He tells us to encourage and to spur one another on and to lift and edify, uplift and build one another as we see those days approaching. And so if we begin to realize what James says, James says if you want to draw close to God, and have God draw close to you, then we need to allow the Spirit to begin to correct our issues and our behavioral patterns or to correct our heart or to, to wash our heart with the truth of His Word. And that's our desire and our goal this morning. As we start out, we're naming it, and if, if there is a name that could be given to a message, we're calling it the propriety in worship. And hopefully some of it will come up on the overhead, and it will be have some of the scriptures on the screen. Some of them may not be there, but it's the priority or the propriety in worship. The word propri propriety actually means proper behavior or proper manners, a conformity to established standards. And we know that according to Matthew 22, verse 37 through 40, God established the standards of love. Amen? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. So it is the proper behavior or manners and conformity to the established standards of God's love, appropriate and suitable actions to the purpose of of worshiping or serving God. In other words, behavior that is accepted socially and morally correct and proper in the eyes of our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. We've been talking over the past about getting our name put in the book of remembrance that we read in Malachi chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, and recognizing everything we say, everything we do, God is watching, God is paying attention. He's listening to the conversations that you have with one another. He notices how you respond to another individual, and whether it's with arrogance and, and self-righteousness, or whether it's in a humility of love and compassion and care about that person. So as we begin to look again this morning, we shared a little bit last couple of weeks about how Paul has given us three, four, five chapters in the book of Corinthians on love. He's also given us over in the book of Romans a pretty good indication in chapter 14 what it means to really care about one another and our weaker brothers and sisters in their conscience and what it means to lay down our life and to have love. But as we go back this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1 and 2, be imitators of me just as I also am an imitator of Christ. Now I praise you because you remember me in everything and you hold firmly to the traditions. The word traditions actually means to the teachings, just as I have delivered them to you. You see, we are to follow the example of Christ. According to the scripture, we are to walk as he walked. And we have mentioned to you that there are so many words in our English language that we only have one word for that they would have two or three in the Greek. And one of them is walk. And to you and I, one of the words walk is to tread around. But another one of the ones, and in the way it means it to walk as Christ did, was to be regulated and to conduct your life in the exact same way, in the exact same manner as Christ did. And that was in love for God the Father and love for one another. So our main objective of my life, the main objective of your life, of a believer's life, 
is to please. And that word please is to accommodate or to open oneself up to the desires of another. And so our purpose is to accommodate ourselves or open ourselves to the desire of God, to please God and to promote His dignity, to promote His honor, to be Christ-like. And as we have stated in the past, to be Christ-like is number one, love for God and love for others. People, our love for God is directly related and it is revealed. Now listen to me, please. Our love for God is directly related and it is revealed in your concern for God's honor, for God's dignity. It is in a concern that you do not want to disgrace God. In fact, if you were to go over to Romans chapter 2, and if you was to read verses 17 through 24, although Paul is talking here to the Jew, you could insert, instead of Jew, you could insert Christian, or you could insert a believer. And he is saying that if we're not careful in our actions, and in our behavior, and in our spirit and attitude, we can actually be the reason that God's name is blasphemed, or that God's uh, honor is being disrespected. God's honor is being disgraced because of the way we live, because of our actions, our, our vocabularies, because of, of certain behavioral patterns. And so when we begin to realize that one of the things about love is revealed in our concern for God's dignity, for God's honor, but it's also revealed in our concern for God's will to be done in our life. Luke chapter 22 and verse 42, Jesus praying in the garden of Gethsemane says, Lord, if it be possible, let this cup pass, but yet not my will, but your will be done in my life. You see, people, please hear my heart this morning. One of the things that God has really been sharing in my spirit is that if I'm not careful, I can become very unconcerned about what God wants and become way more concerned about what I want and then try to use what I want as a, a balance to get me to, to talk and pray to God and say, Lord, here's what I want. I want this and this and this and this is how I want it. I want it this way and this way and then this is when I want it. I want it now. And that's not what God is asking us to do. God is wanting you and I to begin to be more concerned about His will. Not our will, but yours be done. Jesus says, pray after this manner. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, your will be done. And I'm going to put McConnell's unauthorized in here. And for those of you that may be visitors, since my name is McConnell, it's my unauthorized. Do not go looking on the internet for the un, uh, McConnell unauthorized version, okay? But what I'm saying is not my will, but yours be done. Lord, let it be done in my life exactly the way you wish it to be done. Also, we'll be concerned about the Word of God and the truth of the Word of God, that it's not watered down, that we would maintain the purity of His Word and desire the nearness of His presence in our life. And according to James, if we want that presence, we'll be willing to cleanse our heart and our soul and wash our, our hands, so to speak, or our activities and our behaviors. Also, Christ's love for humans was seen in His compassion his kindness, his tears, his humility, his coming in essence to an altar. Those that came to pray for those at the altar are coming to be the hand of Christ extended, concerned about those that are up here, showing compassion for those that are hurting and needing prayer. It was his good deeds, his gentleness, his forgiveness, his patience, his kindness. Christ demonstrated his love when he rebuked and he corrected people. He tried to, to warn people. He demonstrated his love when he continually warned them about hell or when he warned them about dangers and then offered himself as a sacrifice in their place. People, when my kids were younger, even today, they're, they're 38, 39, 40 years old, 42 years old, even today, because I love my kids, I still will have a tendency to warn them about potential dangers. 
I don't try to tell them how to live. I don't try to give them do's and don'ts. But I do try to say, hey, watch this. Be careful. Pay attention. Just this morning with an individual I was speaking with, I wasn't trying to tell them what to do. I wasn't trying to say, you do this, you don't do this. I was trying to warn them about some possibility of a potential danger. It was not because I was trying to be legalistic. It wasn't because I was trying to give them a bunch of do's and don'ts. I was concerned about their safety. I was concerned about issues that may potentially get them into a dangerous situation. And so what do I do? Out of love, I warn them. And people, please grasp and understand that when Christ warns us or when He tries to correct us, He tries to direct us through His Spirit, through His Word and the truth of His Word. It's not because He's wanting to make you legalistic or a bunch of do's and don'ts. It's because He cares intensely and immensely for you. And this is the example that you and I are to imitate. And in verse 2, when Paul uses the words tradition, as we have already said, he uses the word teaching, which means you hold firmly to the doctrine of truth. You hold firmly to the moral standards, to the civil codes of conduct that was delivered by Christ through Paul. Many people do not realize Many people that does not study the life of Paul does not know that once Paul accepted the Lord, you can read this in the book of Acts, when Paul was on the road to Damascus and he had his experience with the Lord Jesus Christ and Paul at that point had his name changed from Saul to Paul. God led him out into the Arabia desert. Now listen to this. God led Paul out into the Arabia desert for three years. For three years, Paul was at the Mount Sinai in the Arabia desert where Moses received the law and the Spirit of God came down upon the mountain at the time of Pentecost. Paul was out in the Arabia desert at Mount Sinai receiving the vision, the revelation, the mystery to the church because God had called him to be an apostle to the Gentiles. God had called him to be an apostle to you and to myself. Therefore, Paul is saying that when he is speaking of teachings, he's meeting the doctrine. He's meaning the truth, the moral standards, the civil code of conduct that was delivered to him at Mount Sinai by the Spirit of God so that he then could in turn relate that to you and I, to the church. That is love. That's God's agape. That is loving your neighbor. And he says, whatever you do in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whatever you do, whether you eat or whether you drink, it doesn't matter. Do it to the glory. Do it to the honor. Do it to the dignity. Do it for the splendor of God. And be careful not to ignore a weaker brother or sister and do not become a stumbling block or an offense by arrogantly pushing our liberties and our freedoms without the concern for others. You want to know more of what Paul is saying on that subject? Go to Romans chapter 14 and read down through chapter 14 and especially from verses 17, clear through chapter 15 in verse 3. I'm not going to take the time to read it this morning, but make a note and go read that portion of Scripture. Paul goes on in verses 3 and 16, and he deals on how men and women are to conduct themselves and to present themselves with dignity, with modesty, so as to show respect for the honor and the glory of God in public. To show respect and honor for one another in public, so as not to disgrace themselves. The wife, not to disgrace the husband. The husband, not to disgrace the wife. And none of us disgrace God. We'll come back, if the Lord willing, at a later day to that subject. But just know this for now. Do you know that most of our believers today have no concept that the way we appear in public 
could possibly be a disgrace to God. And it could also be a disgrace to one another and a stumbling block to others. I don't want to go there, but just think about that. That the way you appear in public, it's got to be with dignity. It's got to be with modesty. And we do not want to become a disgrace to the Lord Jesus Christ or to one another or place a stumbling block. It's not always just about the way we think, the way we talk, but sometimes it's about our behavior and our actions and even our own modesty. As we go on to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and Paul says, but in giving the instruction, I do not praise you because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. Or in other words, your meetings are doing more harm than they are good. Why? Because of the lack of compassion, the lack of care, the lack of concern for God and for others. And then he goes on in verse 20 of that same chapter of 1 Corinthians 11. There war when you meet together. Now listen to this, please, and pay attention closely because I want you to grasp the reality and the concept that every believer in here is the body of Christ. Amen? If we are going to be partakers and sharers as the body of Christ, then we need to share in the activities of the Lord Jesus. Walk as He walked. Regulate and conduct ourselves as He did. Therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper, because in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry and another is drunk. You see, the significance of the Lord's Supper is to be a motivation. When we take communion, it is to be a motivation of remembrance, to remind us that we need to monitor our behavior we need to be diligent that we are showing compassion and care and love for one another. That we are abstaining from all appearances of evil, all behavioral aspects that could give the appearance of being involved in something evil. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21 through 22. But examine, that word examine, it tells us everything carefully. Examine all of your activities, all of your conversations, all of your behavior. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain. And the word abstain means to hold back. Keep away from every form, every appearance of evil. Stay away from it for the dignity, the compassion, and the care of God. Here today, in most of our churches, we simply... When we come to communion, we partake of a little piece of bread and a small cup of juice to celebrate the Lord's Supper. But here, the Corinthians observed the Lord's Supper with a full-fledged meal, a love feast, would be similar to our potlucks today. So in the context, it relates to this meal, this love feast. And they would gather for the fellowship meal before they would then take of the communion. And there were three abuses, which is still very applicable for today. So please, people, listen to my heart carefully as I want to share something because it applies to our churches today. Number one, there were divisions and cliques within the church that corrupted the Lord's Supper. Now, don't misunderstand me. We all have people that we like to fellowship with. We all have those that we connect with and we seem to connect with more adequately than we do others. Amen? But this is different. It's where they would ignore everybody else constantly and they would gather together in their little cliques and when their divisions and their cliques, their factions or their party begin together, the spirit became in disorder and there was pain, there was anger, there was disturbance, there was rumor, there was gossip, there was pride, there was selfishness, there was misunderstanding, there was misrepresentations that would transpire when they got into their little group and there would be no love, no concern, no compassion, no laying down their life for someone else. 
Number two, there was a self-deception. The knowledge would puff them up and they would become self-righteous and that would corrupt the Lord's Supper. Simply deceiving themselves in coming together and partaking of the communion cup and the bread. And they thought they were celebrating the Lord's Supper, but in reality, they were being deceived. What they was doing was not remembering and honoring the Lord. They were only satisfying themselves. And their meeting was utterly meaningless and useless to the Lord. Remember what God tells us, let him who thinks he stands, who is arrogantly puffed up and has an opinion of himself that may not necessarily be the same opinion that God would have of them. And number two, three, there was selfishness and neglect of others which corrupted the Lord's Supper. You see, when the early church came together for the love feast, Everyone brought all of the food, just like the Finger Food Fellowship. We had Wednesday night. Everybody bought the food, and we all joined together, and we all shared. There was be plenty for everyone, including the poor, including the slaves, that wouldn't be able to bring much. And the whole idea was to have a common meal where every believer shared together. But instead of doing this, what was happening at the Corinthian church is that everyone would set off in their own little group and they would take the food that they brought and they would only share with their clique. They would only share with their division. They would only share with their little, depart, uh, their little party. And there was real no Christian fellowship or no love whatsoever being experienced. Can I just meddle here for a moment? Have you ever been to a potluck and felt like you had to sit alone because nobody really knew you yet and you were just sitting there all by yourself while everybody else gathered over and that knew one another and gathered together and here you are by yourself? That's not what God intended, people. If we got someone new in our fellowship, a visitor or someone in a pot, we're supposed to reach out and pull them in, bring them in and make them feel part of the body. Amen? And this is what they were doing. They were ignoring that. So when Paul uses the term in chapter 21, or excuse me, chapter 11 and verse 21, one remains hungry and another gets drunk. Paul's not talking about alcohol intoxication here. The word drunk has a couple of meanings in the scripture, just like the word wine has a couple of meanings. There's the fermented wine, and then there's the non-fermented that's just the juice. There is the word walk, where you tread around and then it's regulate. There are so many different words, and this is another word that has more than one meaning. And the meaning of it here is the fact that it refers not to necessarily someone being intoxicated with alcohol, but it means someone being a glutton to be overfilled. You see, in order to be intoxicated with alcohol, you have to be a glutton and be overfilled. Amen? And so the word intoxicated or drunk means to be overfilled. How many of you have ever pushed away from the table and go, I'm so full? Well, according to the use of the scripture, at that point, you're drunk with food. You're overindulged with food at that point in time. So in this case, Paul's not talking about the intoxication from alcohol, but he's talking about being a selfish glutton and trying to eat everything yourself and not sharing. Remember, Paul is speaking about our loving God and loving one another. He's saying that even though something in and of itself may not be wrong, if you remember back last week, even though something in and of itself may not be wrong, the spirit behind it may be. It can also be being done in a blatant disrespect for God and for others. So what they are totally doing is worrying more about themselves, gratifying themselves. It's all about eros. It's not about agape here. We're not trying to build a case for or against anything. This is about Christ-likeness. This is about you and I recognizing and remembering that Christ not only loved, but he was holy, he was righteous. And the Lord's Supper is all about the body of Christ being given in death, his blood being shed sacrificially on the cross and on the altar for us. And if we are 
part of the body of Christ and to be a partaker and a sharer in the body of Christ, then we need to be a partner in laying down our life. Because the word share, if we go back to 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 18, look at the nation of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifice sharers in the altar? You see, the word share is number 2844 in the Strong's. It means a partner. It means an associate. It means a companion in anything. So if you and I are an associate, if we are a companion, if we are a partner with Christ, then we are to be sharing in His death. And sharing in His death means we share by putting our self to death. We empty ourselves of self. And we take on the form of a servant to serve one another. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 27 through 29, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know what that means, people? That means that if you ignore other people, if you are un unconcerned of a weaker brother or a weaker sister, they're part of the body of Christ as well. And that means that you are at that point guilty of the blood or the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. A man should examine himself, but quickly. He says, for he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment, that's condemnation of wrong, to himself if he does not judge. The word judge, here's another one of them words where it means more than one thing. There is the scripture where the word judge means do not condemn. Do not say there's no hope for them. But then there's the other word judge, which is used here, and that is to discern, to make a distinction, to separate, to correctly and rightly make a decision of what the body really truly is. What does it mean to drink in an unworthy manner? Being the fact that Paul is speaking to the Corinthian church, apparently whatever they were doing must have been what Paul meant to be unworthy. And let's take a quick look at that. If you stay with me for just a little bit longer, please. The Corinthians were guilty, number one, of partaking of the Lord's Supper with no concern for Christ, no concern for the weaker brother and sister, no concern for the poor. There was that spirit of division. The second, the spirit of heresy. There was the faction, the cliques, the little party groups that would stay together and take care of strictly themselves. Number three, the spirit of self-deception. They thought they were more arrogantly, more knowledgeable, and they were more worthy than someone else. Number four, a spirit of selfishness, selfish indulgent, me and me only. Number five, a spirit of drunkenness, that is gluttony, overfilling oneself and ignoring those others that are around you. And number six, a spirit of neglecting the poor. Number seven, a spirit of irreverence and carelessness in protecting the sanctity of the church. The bottom line, there was the lack of love and not even recognizing it. There was the lack of love for God, the disrespect for God, the lack of love for one another, the weaker brother or the sister, the disrespect for the weaker brother or sister. Now, as we get ready to wrap this up, listen close, please. To eat and to drink for us in an unworthy manner is to participate at the Lord's table with an indifference, a self-centeredness, a self-gratification, an irreverent spirit, absolutely no intention, no desire, no concern to stop reckless and questionable behavior that may be a disgrace to God, that may be a disgrace to someone else, that may cause a weaker brother and sister to stumble and to fall, trying to participate in both the Lord's table and the table of the, the world's. You see, again, please be reminded to share means to be a partner, to be a companion. And if you and I are a companion with the Lord Jesus Christ, that means we're going to share in his sufferings. We're going to share in his death. We're going to lay ourselves down and aside. So hear what Paul is saying to those that are unworthily doing this. He says, you're missing the mark 
against the Lord. You're not distinguishing. You're not recognizing. You're not being able to discern the true Lord's body. Everyone in here that is a believer is part of the Lord's body. Everyone in here with a weaker conscience is just as valuable. And Jesus Christ died for that individual as much as he did with someone with a stronger conscience that might grasp the liberty and the freedom of Christ that they have. But we may not understand if we're not careful to distinguish that and we will treat the blood or we were guilty of treating the blood of Christ then therefore as being unholy. People, please hear what I'm saying. If we don't show the compassion and the care and the concern for the weaker brother and sister, then we're forgetting that Christ's blood was shed for them too. We're not being a partaker and a partner and a companion with the, the, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not recognizing that our neighbor is also one whom Christ has died for. And in that aspect, if we're not careful, we could be treating the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ as an unholy thing. And this will reference us back to 1 Corinthians 8, verse 8 through 13. Food will not commend us to God. We are neither worse if we eat, nor the better if we do. I know Paul's talking about food and drink here, but let's apply that to other behavioral aspects and other behavioral patterns that you and I know that as we shared last week, in and of itself, something may not be wrong but what it represents, what's standing behind it, might be very destructive. We shared last week that the flag of the United States, the Christian flag, is nothing more than a piece of material in and of itself. But what it stands for, what it stands behind it, means a lot. It's very real. The Lord Jesus Christ. And for someone to disrespect that, for someone to disrespect the flag, the Christian flag, to disrespect the flag of the United States is showing a very strong disregard for what it stands for and showing a very strong disregard to you and I and what we stand for. And so he says, take care that the liberty does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. If you see someone who has the knowledge dining in an idol's temple, will not his conscience, if he's weak, be strengthened to go ahead and do things that he shouldn't be doing? For though your knowledge who he know he is weak is ruined, through your knowledge he who is weak is ruined. For the brother who's, for the brother, excuse me, is ruined. The brother for whose sake Christ died, and so by sinning against that brother and against wounding their conscience, you sin against the body of Christ. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, no matter what my behavioral pattern is, if it's going to hurt somebody else, if it's going to show a disgrace to another brother or sister, if it's going to show a disgrace to my wife, if my dignity and my modesty and the way I present myself in public could potentially be a disgrace to the Lord and Savior that I stand to represent that I'm going to change for the sake of the Lord and for the sake of my brothers and my sisters. I'm going to be careful in my actions. I'm going to be careful what I say, how I say it. And then he goes on. He said, I will not cause my brother to stumble. People, this is not about what we eat or what we drink or whether we eat or drink or whether we don't. This is setting freedom. This is about you taking freedoms and the knowledge that you might have, setting it aside and throwing it to the wind to serve self rather than to serve God, to love God and to be concerned about God. And be careful not to use those liberties as a reason to have self-gratification and pleasure. And again, as we close, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, 33 whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it to the glory, do it to the honor, to the dignity, to the respect, to the superiority of God. Give no offense to the Jews, to the Greeks, or to the church of God, just as I also please, as I am concerned and operating to where the opinion and the desires of, of God is going to be met. So just as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many so that they may be saved. You see, we're called to regulate and conduct our lives as Christ did, to be Christ-liked. 
Then in Romans 14, 21, it is not good to eat meat or drink wine or do anything by which your brother could possibly potentially stumble. You see, people, it's just about love. We've made it all about so many other things, do's and don'ts. You can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this, you can't do that, you got to do this, you got to do... All God has asked us to do is believe in Him, amen? To have faith that He is who He says He is and then to regulate our life and conduct our life in a love for Him in a love for one another. To have the desire to not disgrace Him. To have a desire not to disgrace one another but to have the desire to lay down our life, to be a partaker, to be a sharer in the altar in the Lord Jesus Christ and to lay down our life for our brothers and sisters and to let them know that we care, that we care deeply and that we care intimately. Amen? Would you bow with us in prayer? I'm going to ask Brother Jeff Rutherford to come and, and just minister on the piano for a moment, if he would, please. Father, as we are sitting here before you this morning, Lord, I'm asking that you be beginning to move across this fellowship. Lord, I pray that they would hear the very heart of God, that even in, in just coming together in the fellowship, if we're not careful, we can become clickish. We can just have our little party factions and, and that we can, Lord, just... Not, not really pay attention to one another's simplicity or know that one another, not have a compassion on someone that doesn't have a strong of position or a strong of, of confidence as we might have. And so, Lord, we're here this morning to just minister to touch each and every heart and each and every soul. With all heads bowed for just a moment, people, the love of God is not a bunch of do's and don'ts. We make our decisions, we discern, could this hurt, could this not? Would this disgrace God, would this not disgrace? We make decisions out of love and our desire and our longing to please Him. And this morning, if you're here, number one, before we leave, if you're here and you do not know God as your personal Lord and Savior, you've never invited Him into your life, you've never asked Him to come into your life, maybe you're here and you might have a question and you want to ask somebody something. We're going to have someone come and pray with you this morning. If you're here and you need special prayer, would you just slip up your hand and say, Pastor, you know, this is kind of new and I'd really like to talk to somebody. I'd like to ask somebody. I got some questions and I'd like to know a little bit more about the personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. If there's anyone at all, we're not going to belabor it. Just hold up your hand for just a quick second and then we're going to go. If you've accepted the Lord, we appreciate and we are so excited. You are part of the family of Christ and we want to show you our love and our compassion. We're going to wait for just about another one, two minutes, and then I'm going to move on. Is there anyone at all that would want to slip it up? The next thing, I felt like I should have probably said this a little bit earlier, but I didn't. I waited, but I will say it now. I believe that God wanted me to tell somebody here or just say, maybe you're not, I don't know. But you have little compartments in your life. You compartmentalize, so to speak, things. You've got areas in your life that you've got blocked away that only you can go into when you want to go into that may have more activity in the world than anything else and you will not let Lord, the Lord in that compartment to clean it out. You've accepted the Lord. You've asked Him to come into your life. You love the Lord. You want to serve the Lord. But you still have these little compartments and these little areas that you won't let Him in and you won't let Him clean it. You'll only go in there yourself with a certain group of people. You restrict God. And you have a compartment that's for God. And you'll go into that compartment only on a certain day, maybe a Sunday, a Wednesday. You'll go into that compartment for God. You'll go into that compartment when a tragedy hits in your life and you really need prayer and you want God to do something. You'll run to that compartment where you've got God blocked in and you're keeping Him there. God wants you to know that you're keeping Him out of your life. And by keeping him out of your life and compartmentalizing him and only 
letting Him in. If you feel that you've uh, stayed away from Him too long, if you feel like you haven't really fellowshiped with Him enough like you should, then you will run and go into that little compartment and you will try to fellowship and appease Him to a point to where you feel that He's satisfied and then you come back out of that compartment and you shut the door and you go on with your life in all of the other compartments but not let Him in. You're keeping Him out. If that's you this morning, God wanting you to know He wants to come into that compartment. He wants you to open the entirety of your life and let Him in this morning. If there's anyone here that has accepted the Lord, you love the Lord, you want the Lord to be part of your life, but you've got Him only in one little compartment and you only go in to appease Him periodically, but you don't let Him in the rest of your life and you realize you need to start letting Him in to the rest of your life and you need to tear down them doors, tear down them walls, God is here this morning to tear them down if you'll give Him that chance. Is there anyone at all that'll lift up your hand and say, I have God, yes, just up and back down. Is there anyone else? that'll lift up your hand and say, I've got God compartmentalized. And I, yes, it, just up and down. Is there anyone else? Would you stand with us this morning, please?